In any given year, people in the economy produce goods and services. They produce television sets, books, pencil sharpeners, DVD players, attorney services, haircuts and much more. Have you ever wondered what the total dollar value of all those goods and services is in your island? Well, it's a massive exercise. So we have never thought of it and I don't see any meaning of finding out the total value of goods and services in the economy. First of all, there is a very simple and holistic way to calculate the value of goods and services in the economy. And it is a very meaningful number. It gives an idea of the overall progress of the economy. Let us see more in detail about this number in my island. Last year, it was $1.384 trillion. In other words, last year, people living and working in our island have produced $1.384 trillion worth of goods and services. That dollar amount, $1.384 trillion, is what we call as the gross domestic product. Simply put, gross domestic product GDP is the total market value of all final goods and services produced annually within a country's borders. Can you please explain by taking a simple example? For sure. Consider a simple economy in which one good is produced and sold. Rahul find an apple seed and plant it. In some years, an apple tree appears. Rahul pays Ram $5 in wages to pick and box the apples. Next, Rahul sells the apples to Vijay for $8. Vijay turns the apples into apple juice and sells the apple juice to Monica for $10. Monica consumes the juice. What is the GDP in this simple economy? Is it $5? Is it $13? Is it $10, $18 or some other dollar amount? We use three approaches in our island to compute GDP. The expenditure approach, the income approach and the value added approach. Let me describe you each approach in terms of a simple economy. Let's first see expenditure approach. To compute GDP using the expenditure approach, we add the amount of money spent by buyers on final goods and services. The words final goods and services are important in computing GDP because not all goods are final goods. Some goods are intermediate goods. Please define clearly both final good and intermediate good. I am little confused. See, a final good or service is a good in the hands of the ultimate consumer. Think of buyers at each stage of value creation. The first buyer in our simple economy was Vijay. He bought apples from Rahul. The second buyer was Monica, who bought the apple juice from Vijay. Monica is the final buyer in this economy. She is the final user the ultimate consumer and she is consuming the final product, which is apple juice. In other words, she herself doesn't add any further value to it and doesn't sell to another person. The good that she buys is the final good. So then, what are the apples? Aren't they a final good too? No. In this imaginary economy, the apples is an intermediate good because they were not consumed directly by consumers like Monica. An intermediate good is an input in the production of a final good. In other words, the apples were used to produce apple juice, the final good. So what does GDP equal if we use the expenditure approach to compute it? Any guesses? Simple. It is the dollar amount spent by buyers for final goods and services. In our simple economy, 
there is only one buyer, Monica, who spends ten dollars on one final good, apple juice. Thus, GDP in our tiny economy is ten dollars. I am still not very clear why expenditures on final goods only are counted when computing GDP. This is because we would be double counting if we counted expenditures on both final goods and intermediate goods. Double counting refers to counting a good more than once when computing GDP. How? If we count both Monica's purchase of the apple juice, ten dollars. And Vijay's purchase of the apples, eight dollars. We count the purchase of the apples twice. Once when the apples are purchased by Vijay, and once when the apples are converted into apple juice. So, while a product is going up the value chain by adding value to it, if we add up the product at each stage of the value chain, we are double. Or possibly triple counting it, and in that case, the economic activity, or GDP, is not correctly measured. In order to achieve the right measurement, we therefore use only the value of the final product. Hmm, very interesting. Now I got it. Let's now touch upon the two other approaches to calculate the GDP in your economy. In your Fantastic! I am through with this. Now, tell me more about the second key variable in the economy, that is interest rate. Let's take an example. Imagine that a bullock cart owner, Tom, agreed to lend ten bullock cart to his neighbor's Harry for an entire season. The condition of the loan is, Harry would return eleven bullock carts at the end of the year. That is. Ten bullock carts, that is principal, and one bullock cart, that is interest. This would constitute a one-year loan of a product at the interest rate of ten percent. At the end of one year, Harry returns the agreed eleven bullock carts to Tom. Next time again, Harry wanted to do the same thing, that is. He wanted to borrow ten bullock carts from Tom at the rate of ten percent interest rate. The only difference is this time he proposed repaying the loan in money rather than in bullock cart. They ascertain in the market that each bullock cart costs hundred dollars, so ten bullock carts would cost one thousand dollars, and Harry would return. Eleven hundred dollars this time, instead of eleven bullock carts. Tom, though it sounded fine, agreed to the deal. In the second year, owing to a general upward trend in prices, prices of bullock cart also rose by ten percent from hundred dollars to hundred and ten dollars. As a result, when Harry made good on the loan by paying Tom. Eleven hundred dollars at the end of the year. Tom was only able to buy ten bullock carts, not eleven. With that sum of money, it was as if Tom had lent his bullock cart at no interest at all. So, under the second agreement, the nominal interest rate was ten percent, but real interest rate was zero, as Tom has not earned. Anything real over and above his investment. In general, the real interest rate is defined as real interest rate is equal to nominal interest rate minus inflation. For Tom to have maintained an effective real interest rate of ten percent, that is, with regard to output rather than money, he would have to raise his nominal interest rate to approximately twenty percent. Or twenty-one percent to be exact. At a twenty-one percent nominal rate of interest, Harry would have been required to pay one thousand two hundred and ten at the end of year. That is one thousand principal plus two hundred and ten interest. 
which would have been just enough to allow Tom to buy 11 bullock cart at the new price of 110 each. It is easy to see from this example that if the price of bullock cart had increased by one tenth, that is, its inflation were 10%, Tom would have had to roughly double the nominal interest rate in terms of money to preserve a real rate of interest, that is, in terms of bullock cart of 10%. In assessing whether the cost of borrowing is high or low in the economy, you need to focus on real interest rate rather than nominal interest rate. tool controls the overall supply of money in the system by controlling the money availability with the banks for on lending. If he sets the lever high, banks have to put more money as reserves in the central bank vault and hence there will be less money available with them for on lending. That is, liquidity is sucked out of the system by enforcing higher reserve requirements. Similarly, if the central banker sets the lever low, banks have to put less money as reserves in the central bank's vault and hence there will be more money available with them for lending. That is, liquidity is pumped into the system by reducing reserve requirements. Central banker conducts open market operations by buying and selling of government securities from the financial intermediaries. If he wants to decrease the money supply, he sets the lever down for selling of government securities to financial intermediaries, which results in decreased liquidity. Similarly, if he wants to increase the money supply, he sets the lever to high. This means he buys of government securities from financial intermediaries. In return for these government securities, he will pump money into the financial intermediaries network, which results in increase of liquidity. Is another lever that central banker has to manage money supply. Higher interest rates discourages financial intermediaries to borrow from the central bank or signals an increase in the interest rate for lending. This leads to lower demand from consumers for their own investments. Thus, Increase in interest rate reduces the quantity of money demanded in the economic system for consumption and investment. Similarly, when central bank decreases interest rates, there is more money demanded in the economic system for consumption and investment. What and how much they are demanding, whether collective mood is towards consumption or towards investment or towards savings. Based on this information, he decides which tools to use and in which direction. Financial intermediaries are the heart of the economic system. A typical financial intermediary takes money from lender and gives it to borrowers. All of his actions are driven through the controller's choice of switching on or off both inlet and outlet of the system. When the central bank sets the levers for increasing the money supply, the financial intermediary increases his lending to firms and consumers at lower interest rates. This results in higher consumption and growth in investment, increase in net exports, and also sets the tone for an optimistic business sentiment. This will shift the aggregate demand and aggregate supply to right which means higher output and rising prices. The levels of liquidity increase immensely.